All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is March 7th, 2023, and this is Seba Ben Browns. Today, we're going to talk about ventilator waveforms, but focusing on some key findings that uh, some of them are common, some of them are not that common, but I thought that it would be a cool thing for all of us to discuss today. So, uh, I want you to be aware that uh, for those that are respiratory therapy, there's CRCE available. So, if you are uh, in RT and want to get your CRCE, just put your name on the chat uh, uh, to verify that you attended. And then at the end, I'm going to put a QR code, uh, and, and there's actually going to be a link in the chart that uh, Sherry's going to put in. And just remember, you have to, when you do your evaluation, it must complete to receive uh, credit and within an hour of completion. Okay. Uh, is this there? So, but our disclosures is we discuss particulars of ventilator modes. There's no endorsement of any particular mode manufacturer company. Whatever we say, it's our opinion. And here you have uh, the disclosures for both Rob and I. Uh, who, we are your hosts today. The ground rules, these are recorded sessions. Uh, keep your microphones muted. Um, we may call you to chat with us. Um, and so that you can, but, but in the meantime, you can use the chat function on WebEx. Or if you want to say something, just put it on the chat uh, function of WebEx and we will. Uh, pause and interact. It's really an open forum, really safe uh, from all aspects because we are all learning and you will see that there's a lot of things here that uh, we discuss and we start thinking about what, what, what it means and how are we going to deal with it. So, we always start with what we call a SEBA key uh, knowledge point and today I want to uh, focus you on how a volume control square wave flow, flow waveform looks and what are their components and what you have here on top is what is pressure uh in this middle you have flow and on the bottom you have volume and these three cartoons that you see are um idealized uh waveforms and then on the on the other side you have what would happen if there's an increased resistive load or an increased elastic load, but actually these waveforms that you see are are the real deal. These come from an actual ventilator, and you can see the the, the clear similarities between them. However, there's some aberrancies that will occur, which are artifacts of the device as it it actually performs. The the first thing that we will highlight uh, in general is that when the the system pressurizes, the, the pressure will rise rapidly uh, as soon as the flow starts and the, the, the pressure will rise rapidly, at least on volume control when it happens and the flow increases, it's going to meet initially the resistive load. And that's the initial step up that you see here, uh, that, that you see in this period here, and that you can see in this case of increased resistance, how high the resistive load is. Uh, in classic, uh, education, they would say that you have to add a, a pause at the end of the breath to see how much is the difference between the plateau and the peak, which is a manifestation of when there's no flow uh, of the resistive load. So you can see here a pause and you can see that the space from here to here is the same as the initial step up because the, that's what we would expect uh, as part of the resistive load. So the resistive load remains constant throughout the inspiration. And then at the end of the breath, you have, when you do a pause, uh, if you don't do a pause, then you have this value over here, the peak inspiratory pressure is a manifestation of both the resistance and the elastance. And in this case, the end inspiratory pressure is a manifestation of just the elastic load. So whatever we distended the alveoli. And then you can see that when we, uh, the breath ends, so the flow finishes in this model, which has a high resistance, you can see how the pressure drops. And then there's this oscillation that goes down and up. And I'm pointing that out because we, we do see that uh, in many of the ventilators and it has to do with the algorithm of how the ventilator is trying to keep the pressure at the level that, it, that, that at the PEEP level. 
On the on the other one, uh, on the other waveform, you can see in this case it's an increased elastic load, so there's a very small step up. But what changed is the slope, and so instead of being uh, a, a, this slope, you see now a higher a higher slope. It it changes the pressure changes faster for the given flow or volume delivered. And then when the breath ends, it again drops the pressure but in this case you see again another artifact here in which the pressure instead of dropping rapidly as it should in the idealized waveform it should drop rapidly to the baseline and then to reach peep in this case it took some time to get there and this again has to do with the performance of the ventilator and, and other things that you will see in a second rob comment no it's just to reiterate what you said that the waveforms at the left come from a simulator, in other words, a mathematical model that's perfect. And the ones on the right come from real ventilators, so they uh, will look slightly different. But if you memorize the ones on the left, or if you play with a simulator on your computer, that's what you'll see. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. So, so a, a lot of knowledge here, and as you start looking a little bit more into the waveforms, you're going to start seeing a lot of this, and sometimes it causes challenges in understanding what, what do they, they mean. So, so the first uh, uh, case that we're going to do today is this one that was uh, submitted uh, uh, by Pablo Gonzalez, which actually I see on the, on the call from Scripps Memorial. He's a respiratory therapist there, and he sent us this uh, really nice waveform on a Draeger ventilator, and uh, so we're going to go through it, and I, I put the whole screen so that we could read it. So I, in our classic manner, I would ask you in the chat to start by putting in the tag, what do you think is the load for this patient? And then if you see any patient ventilator discordance uh, for the patient, and, and we go in order, trigger, inspiration, cycle, and expiration. So I'm going to give you a minute. Uh, or so to look at the waveform and start typing in what your thoughts are happening for this patient. Eduardo, do we know if this was a real patient or a test lung or something like that? No, I think this is a this is a real patient, Rob, based on what I'm seeing. A really in interesting one uh, to see. All right. Do we want to get started? All right. There's a lot of. Uh, I see some of the comments starting to come in. So let's start by the, the the tag for this mode. And and I left everything here so that there was no cheating uh, for you because this can be really challenging sometimes to, to be able to, to read this. And so let's start by the tag. Uh, what, what you see is I always go and look at the flow and I'm gonna ask actually Rob to, to talk to us a little bit about the targeting scheme in a second, but let's start with the, 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 so if you look at the waveform for flow, you can rapidly recognize that for each one of the breaths that are here, the flow is different. Uh, in the first one, it seems passive and it, there's an exponential decay, but then it loses the exponential decay. Then there's that, this little humpity dump on it. And then there's this uh, a, a very clear belly that there's PMOS involved on this. So there, these all of them change, and if you see the pressure, the pressure looks flat at the top. So this tells me, uh, and we know this, that this is pressure control. Now, for some, uh, this comes as a, a as a, a really overwhelming statement because you you are seeing on the top that it says that this is volume control, assist control. However, the moment that they press the button that uh, says here auto flow they change the mode from volume control to pressure control. 
although it still says here volume controlled, what you are actually controlling is the pressure. So the machine is controlling the pressure throughout the breath. Then the breath sequence, at least on this uh, uh, targeting, and I'm not as familiar with this uh, Draeger as I as I used to be, but the uh, they used to have, uh, I mean, I, they, they used to change color when there was evidence of PMOS to, to trigger the ventilator. Is that, that right, Ariel? I don't see any deflections before the, the trigger on this uh on these ventilators, Tim says the same. Uh, okay, so t t Tim, thank you. So because of that, I presume that every single one of the breads that we see here are mandatory. Um, so uh, I would say that at, the, at least at this point, and you have down here the inspiratory time, and I don't see any that is a different size. This one has an, an end inspiratory pause. So I would say that this is CMB. Sorry for the handwriting. I don't have my little pen as I usually do. Uh, and so all of the breaths are uh, time cycled. So it makes it CMB. And then finally, uh, the, the, the targeting scheme. So because it's auto flow, uh, we know that this is an adaptive targeting. So you set the tidal volume that you want and the machine is going to adjust the inspiratory pressure. So actually, if you pay attention a little bit to the top pressure, you may see that there's some variation on the height of the pressure in relation to the prior one. So I think that this that, that shows that this is adaptive and there's evidence of PMOS. And then uh, the other feature that got uh, activated is this one that says ATC, so which is the adaptive uh, tube compensation. And because it's here, then we know that it's active, and that would tell us that the the other tag is R or servo. So, Rob, you you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, it's uh, you've summarized everything quite well. Um, the the main thing to take away from this is that um, the manufacturer wants you to believe that this is volume control, simply because you get an average tidal volume. Uh, because you can set a tidal volume, but by the classification, volume control means you set a tidal volume and a flow. So you can't do that here. You set an average tidal volume. That, as you can see, the tidal volume varies on breath by breath basis. That is not true with a true tidal volume. I mean, volume control classification. So that's one thing. Um, also, if you were to if you were to draw a straight line across the peak pressures, you would see that you know, as the inspiratory effort of the PMUS goes up, the, the uh, inspiratory pressure goes down. Again, in adaptive targeting, the ventilator um, attempts to adjust the delta P, the difference between inspiratory pressure and, and expiratory pressure, uh, to give the the preset, the, the target tidal volume, uh, but it doesn't necessarily do that every single breath. It can go up and down, it could vary a lot in proportion to how the PMUS varies. So the best you can do is that on average you get the tidal volume you have set. Um, and again, if the patient makes a huge inspiratory effort, it overrides the whole thing and the patient can get whatever tidal volume they want. So that has to be kept in mind. Now, the other interesting factor here is that um, tube compensation. Tube compensation or automatic tube compensation was originally invented by a guy named Gutman. And his idea was that you want to provide just enough pressure support on a spontaneous breath to uh, overcome the resistive load of breathing. And the idea was essentially to be able to extubate somebody without the, the actual danger of truly extubating, to see if they could, they could um, support their own elastic load without having to struggle against breathing against uh, the, the resistance of the endotracheal tube. For whatever reason, Ventilator manufacturers have allowed you to add that on to mandatory breaths or even um, pressure control breaths. It was originally designed to be used like in CPAP, right? But now ventilator manufacturers allow you to add it on to breaths that are already supporting both the elastic and the resistive load, right? So what does that mean? I don't know. I have no idea what that means. Why would you do it? I have no idea why you would do it, but people do it. 
Uh, I, all that does is confuse the weaning process as far as I'm concerned. There's no logical uh, explanation that I, I've ever seen for why you might do that in this particular situation. So anyways, um, does that cover everything? Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, the, the original model for uh, adaptive tube compensations created negative pressure on the on the on and the right. it, it does both. It does both. Uh, and so it had the ability to pressurize and de uh, and depressurize the circuit. Depressurize it. And, and so that would be assisted exhalation, essentially, is what that was. And and so during the dur the the difference uh, of how it's implemented, because the ventilators that we have do not generate negative pressure mm -hmm. in the airway, is by dropping the pressure below PEEP. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which uh, you you can see, and this 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 is what the question that we post on Twitter is: What is this drop in pressure that you see immediately mm -hmm. during exhalation? And that is the the comp the compensatory mechanism that adapted to compensation will do by dropping the pressure as you're exhaling to decrease yeah. the to aid the exhalation process on these uh, patients. Right, and the and the. The take home message here is that the driving pressure for peak expiratory flow is plateau pressure minus PEEP. So if you drop the PEEP, even for a few milliseconds, you increase that driving pressure and the peak expiratory flow will go up. In fact, you could even see it. You see where the orange line is? That peak flow is a little bit higher than, than the ones before that. So, um, they do this on, on home care ventilators as well. They call it um, C flex. C flex, yeah, there's C flex is Phillips, and there's another one for Resmed, but it's an expiratory uh, pressure drop. Uh, but they do it for different Therapy. reasons. They do it so that you don't, so it's easier for the patient to exhale and they don't wake up during their sleep for um, apnea. Anyways, um, yeah, it's it, you have to understand the underlying physics of this and, and why they do it and, and whether or not it's appropriate. So. If, they, if it was only turned on to reduce um, auto peep, you know, that might actually work. But an inspiratory uh, assistance makes no sense to me at all. Yeah, so so it, it's an it's a interesting situation. I mean, in, in the way that it's designed, ATC should be a mode that only is active when you're on pure CPAP and you're trying to do an SBT to assess the work of breathing of the patient. That's that's what I envision this mode to be. Not necessarily as an aid when you're giving positive uh, when you're giving uh, support for the elastic and resistive work. Is that correct, Rob? Actually, I see it. Yep. Alrighty. There, there's uh, um, a good amount of of comments. There's one uh, by Tim. Uh, if a patient started triggering breaths, would the tag change? Uh, and he says that is the tag fixed by the set mode, or does the patient ventilator interaction change the nomenclature? And the simple answer for that, Tim, is that the nomenclature does not change. The tag remains the same. However, what you need to be aware is that if a patient is passive, uh, sometimes you cannot determine what the tag is just by looking at the waveforms. Uh, so it may look uh, without any PMOS, it will look like uh, just a, a CMB mode. And if the patient starts breathing, then it may, or it's only breathing throughout this, it may only look like a CSB mo uh, breath sequence. But uh, uh, so, so that's that. That's the the answer for that. So no, it does not change with breathing. What you see on the screen does, and your interpretation may change. But when we tag something, it's a tag forever. Uh, yeah, sometimes you have to put these things on a simulator to actually reveal the true targeting scheme. So, for example, if you tried to ventilate a patient um, with flow adaptation on a servo and it was passive, you'd never know that it was dual targeting. You have to have that inspiratory effort to reveal that it is, in fact, a dual targeting scheme. And this has happened through band rounds, actually. There, there's times that we're seeing the waveforms here, and we're like, whoops, this is a different uh, tag that we thought that it was, because uh, you cannot test everything. 
Uh, the other uh, comment that comes is, uh, uh, is for you, Rob. It says, PAB includes some sort of ATC to assist with the resistive component of breathing, like ATC is included in PAB. And uh, actually, I think it's not ATC, but go ahead, PAB. Legal PAB, it, Rob. That's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> PAB and PAB, yeah. PAB, um, there's two forms of PAB, the original one and the one that Drager does. And the one that Drager does is maybe easier to understand because you can actually set how big of a resistive load and how big of an elastic load you want PAV to compensate for. Whereas on PAV plus on the Medtronic ventilators, it's all mixed into a work figure. So anyways, ATC can be thought of as simply the resistive workload support. So PAV does have that. So in fact, you could, I think you could probably set on the Drager the elastic workload to zero, and then all you'd have is the resistive workload, and that would be ATC by definition. But I, I wouldn't recommend that you think about that way. Just make your head explode. All right, let's keep moving. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good question, Ariel. What is the load? <coughs> so during inspiration, in this one that is pretty passive, uh, the inspiratory time is one second and it reaches zero. So I would say that the main load looks like elastic. Uh, uh, also looking at the expiratory pace, it returns relatively rapidly, but there is also the presence of PMOS. So in the ones that I can see, I see elastic, but in the other ones, uh, this one and this one and this one, there is clear evidence of PMOS on them. Uh, and then in terms of PV discordance, I didn't see what the thought was on the the PMOS, but I don't. I think that these breaths are triggered by the machine, and so under those circumstances, what we're seeing is early trigger. So we're uh, we're seeing the machine trigger earlier than the patient, also called reverse trigger, at least on breath. Uno, dos, three, four, five, and actually six has an evidence of PMOS. Like you can see it. Sorry, right here. That little divot also up there. During inspiration, there's some degree of work shifting, but that's a manifestation of the the PV discordance. So overall, I would say that it's normal. The cycle uh, also is abnormal at least on this breath, but that is a manifestation of what I think is early trigger. So I'm going to say that it's normal. Otherwise, an expiration looks passive, so we're going to say it's normal. And so the 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 summary is that you have PCCMB. AR and it's uh, what we call a clandestine mode because you have auto flow active and ATC active. So that's why these two features are on on a patient with an elastic load and presence of PMOS and the PMOS seems to be early trigger based on what I'm seeing here just um, out of it. So uh, very good. One more thing I want to add Eduardo. Yeah. Years ago, I did a study on Dragers when we had them here. And believe it or not, they allow you to put ATC on top of PAP. And I discovered in the lab that that's not a good idea. That would be like double dipping. Yeah, and that's what so, we found too. It's illegal it's on every part. part. Okay. All righty. Well, uh, I want to thank Pablo for for sharing this uh, this really cool uh, image and and to all of you to please send us as many as you want. Pablo, anything you want to comment? All right. Very good. So let's move on to our next one. Our our next uh, image is actually from one of our patients uh, over here, and so. Um, uh, pretty distressing. Actually, this is not from us. This was sent to us uh, asking us what was happening. And so I'll give you a minute to win it. Take a look at it and tell us what you think it is going on on this human being. This is a key finding. It's an atypical one, but it's a concerning one.
All righty. So let's get get started. This this um, this this patient has uh, the the mode that we we are dealing with uh, under these circumstances. This is a a uh, in this case the the patient was on um, pressure control. So so we're controlling the pressure through the inspiration. And you see that actually the flow drops relatively fast. No, actually this is the, the sorry, I'm, uh, I'm uh, failing at, at something. This patient has a proximal sensor. Uh, no, this was not a proximal sensor. This is actually a pressure control. Sorry, I'm lying to you all uh, completely. So this is pressure control. You can see the pressure is being controlled through the, through the inspiration. Uh, we we don't see any evidence of PMOS. At least I, I don't see any evidence of PMOS of triggering. This ventilator puts a little happy triangle down here whenever there is a patient. Uh, the, when there's patient activity and we don't see any patient activity. Uh, then we see uh, the all the breaths are the same. So these are triggered by by time right now, and so at least from the breaths that we're seeing, this is CMB. And the uh, targeting scheme, all the breads look the same, so I cannot make much if this is more advanced, but so we're going to call it S for now. During inspiration, uh, you can see that the, the pressure goes up uh, because we pressurize the system. And uh, it peaks, all the peaks are the same size and actually all the, all the tidal volumes are at the same height. And then it returns to baseline uh, rapidly. And uh, actually, the I time is set appropriately, and it, it just simply shuts off and, and goes into expiration. So uh, I think that the load is elastic. Uh, when you see the expiration, it's a little bit abnormal. So what you see here is that the, the system depressurizes, but it takes a fair amount of time to get to baseline. No, it doesn't go rapidly. And the the peak flow, the expiratory peak flow is certainly lower than the inspiratory inspiratory flow, uh, but then it doesn't really go back to baseline. And then there's this step up hook, and it goes to to zero flow. And so uh, the, the it, it, so so you have the, the the there's active expiration. You actually see the volume go down, and then suddenly uh it drops down to zero and you have what it seems zero flow there's still some exhalation uh you can see there but uh the pressure is not returning to baseline and there's this odd step down and so that's pretty at a typical that doesn't look like anything it doesn't look like there's pmos it doesn't uh, and if anything it looks like the resistance is increased during uh, expiration there's a low peak flow and the the flow doesn't go to baseline at time, and that's the atypical thing here. So there's no patient ventilator discordance. There's no patient uh, activity right now, but there is this ab abnormal figure. Uh, anybody has an idea of what's causing this? The key, the key finding is the, 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 the length of time that is getting to get to baseline on the, on this patient. Uh, in this particular case, the patient had a, a faulty expiratory valve because it was getting stuck. And so, uh, this is a, a patient that has a, the, 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 one of the thoughts was, is this happening on the airway of the, of the patient? You're right. Uh, uh, that was one of the, the thoughts if there was, uh, meaning the patient is exhaling and suddenly bloop, it, the, the airway collapses and there's zero flow afterwards, which is certainly one of the, the considerations that could, could happen. Uh, but you would expect the pressure to go back to baseline and then from there and, and then see this flow that is occurring, not the, the pressure taking so long. So uh, the, the, because the airway is not dropping as fast as it could, this is uh, tells you that there's something going on with the expiratory limb, and it could be the valve, 
It could be somebody stepping on it. It could be the filter, the expiratory filter being saturated uh, with with fluid. In this case, it was a valve, but uh, I thought that that was pretty pretty interesting. Rob, comments? Yeah, there probably was no alarm in this situation too, right? Mm -hmm. Nope. Yep. So that you have to be vigilant and, and be able to recognize what ideal waveforms look like and when they deviate from that significantly so you could troubleshoot. Yeah, because eventually if that if that gets completely uh, occluded, then you will have a, a no, no ventilation situation. Ariel, you, you Ariel points out that uh, Go from ahead. the graphic, sorry. No, you were saying you can see that the, the ATC is on it as well. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but you can tell from that that, that dotted uh, orange line, P trach. Mm -hmm. You get that because ATC is turned on. I see. It has nothing to do with this this um, problem, I don't think, but it's just another example of um, why why people do things. And it's kind of unclear. Yeah, if anything, it, this should go all the way down if that was the case because the resistance is high. So if ATC was doing it. Good job, Enrique. Yeah, it seems that uh, the, it's an extra thoracic. Definitely it's extra thoracic. It's in the in some part of the of the of the circuit because the, it has to be after the sensor for the pressure. Uh, and that's what you're seeing there. So I think this is, has a Y sensor. So it has to be over here that it's measuring that pressure being elevated and not coming back to baseline. Yeah, it's it's not an airway obstruction. It's an expiratory limb obstruction yeah. somewhere between the patient's ET tube opening and the and the, and the air and the atmosphere through the manifold. That's where the obstruction is. It's not inside the patient. All righty. Uh, and our last one for today, this this one is also a um, uh, really nice one. This is another key finding. Uh, uh, and I, I'll, I'll just walk you through this one because we are at, at the time. So what is the tag? And, and for this one, the tag is relatively simple. You have you have a volume control breath. Uh, the flow is controlled, even though remember on this ventilator, whenever you see this symbol uh, in the in this, that means that they are the waveform that you're seeing is simulated uh, as if it was at the Y. But uh, uh, notwithstanding, this is a pressure control uh, volume control breath. It also has a, a characteristic waveform. For volume control, in which when the when the waveform is uh, descending, as it is in this case, the pressure waveform at the beginning of the breath will have the highest resistance because the flow is the highest, and at the end of the breath, when the flow is the least, it's all uh, elastic uh, load. So uh, the the targeting scheme, every, whenever you're in CMB, I don't see any spontaneous breaths uh, amongst the ones that we have available right now. So I would say that all of these are CSB. Sorry, CMB, CMB. Uh, and the uh, and the targeting scheme is going to be S. In terms of the load, and this is the key finding, if you want to put on the chat, what do you think is the key load that we're seeing on this waveform? We got one of each. Yeah, that's perfect. So, so let's talk about it. So. The, 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 I'm going to focus on the first breath because the first breath doesn't show any PMOS. And when you don't have PMOS, it tells you everything that you can see the loads. So the key finding, the key finding on this waveform is at the beginning of the peak inspir inspiration, you see this huge peak. And then it goes all the way down to, to here. So this is the plateau and this is the highest peak that it has. 
So the beginning of the breath is all resistive. So this tells me, just by looking at it, that the inspiratory resistance is very high. And that can be because you set the inspiratory flow very high or because there's high resistance. But during expiration, you can see the classic features of somebody that has a prolonged uh, time constant. It takes a long period of time to get back to baseline. And on the next one, you see the same, but it has, uh, we're gonna talk about that one in a second. So this tells me that the principal issue is resistance. However, for those that saw, well, you know, there's PMOS, there is PMOS. There is a little bit of evidence of PMOS on this waveform right here and on this one right here. So in this one, look at the prior one and you see the, I mean, the, this is the, 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 the screen is changing, but you can see that there is no such plateau as it was on the prior one and it's gone. And then there is a trigger of the next breath without any exhalation, which tells me that this patient, I, I cannot tell you if this is a reverse trigger or not, but there's evidence of PMOS there. So for those of you that recognize PMOS, you're absolutely right. There was evidence of PMOS on this breath and the same on this one. You can see how you lost that nice, that nice, uh, the, how the pressure was decaying here. And now you have it a little bit of leak. And then after the breath, you have evidence of the patient doing effort. So uh, this is a classic uh, uh, ventilator discordance that we're gonna discuss in a second. In terms of trigger, and that's where this problem comes, at least this one, the second one, I can say without a doubt that that breath is a early, early trigger. So something, this patient is triggering out of sync and it tri the ventilator trigger earlier than the patient. Now, is this reverse, what we know as reverse trigger is to be seen, but uh, I would say that based on, I can only see one breath here that it's a reverse uh, trigger and I, 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 or early trigger. This one over here, I can't tell because I, I don't know if the prior one we had been patient or machine triggered. So I have incomplete information here. And uh, during inspiration, I would say that all of the breaths are assisted. Uh, and so I would say that this is essentially normal. The cycle is normal for the ones that we're seeing. This one that it's early, this is early uh, cycle just because there was an early trigger. So remember, we only call the first uh, the synchrony. And finally, uh, in terms of expiration, I don't see any active work, but I want to point out to you the difference in the size of the area under the curve here and here. And the reason for that is that this breath only is exhaling this amount and this breath is exhaling a double breath. So there is more flow that it's trying to get out, but you can see actually how even with more flow and more pressure in there, the breath is not, the, the flow is not that increased uh, as we would expect, but that's for you to, to be aware of. So in this case, the key findings is that this patient has increased increased resistance. And when you're on the descending ramp and you see this peak over here, you should be concerned that there's something increasing the resistance. And then there's features of an early trigger, which you can imagine in this patient having early trigger and double breath. So this one, it's two breaths. So the patient got, this is a tidal volume of 650. So got around 500 in this breath and the second breath, another 500. So now you have a massive amount of air inside this human being that should not have it with high resistance. So the air trapping, the hemodynamic disaster is gonna happen. Also so that, notice- um, Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, and notice the plateau pressure was almost double too. Oh, that it actually, also indicates you have an almost double tidal volume. Excellent point, Rob. So, so this is the plateau pressure for this breath and compare it with this one. And as Rob said, this was the first plateau pressure, this amount of space. And now it's this amount of space, which looks to be about double of what the patient had. So for all our respiratory therapists, uh, with joy, here is your QR code. Please put your, uh, 
your name on the on the chat so that we can register this and send uh, and, and validate your QR codes. Uh, there's also a link on uh, there on the chat that if you don't want to use your phone or you cannot use your phone, you can click on the link and register there. For those uh, here, here's still the CR, the the CRC uh, link for the RTs, and on the and on the left hand side, you have your uh, for the staff for the physicians that want to get CC, CMEs from CCF. And finally, uh, uh, here's our Twitter. And actually, Ariel, I have to add your Twitter here. Uh, so that you can uh, send Ariel, uh, Rob, or myself. Well, actually, Rob, you you have abandoned completely Twitter, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we're gonna execute Rob from here, and we're gonna put Ariel as our Twitter uh, executive. All right. Fantastic. Uh, really, thank you all for your your time and and being connected to us. And if you have questions or issues, let us know. Bye bye.